Dana Miller presents the ninth annual Obesity Conference, a practical look at obesity, diabetes, and current strategies. Featuring John Morton, MD, Why Weight? Medical Endoscopic Surgical Approaches to Weight, a Continuum of Care. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody today. And as uh, mentioned, uh, I do believe in a full continuum of care for our patients. I think it's just like any other disease. You have to have all treatment modalities available. So I'll go over with you what's kind of my viewpoint of where we are with surgery and, and how uh, it can fit in. And uh, as mentioned, I, um, I am board in obesity medicine for a couple of reasons. When I was president of our society, I felt it was very, very important that we have all hands on deck. We needed the entire house of medicine involved uh, in dealing with obesity. And I take a kind of a positive approach of where we are nowadays with uh, treatment options. If you go back just five years ago, we didn't have all these options available to us. And I think the future's bright. <clears throat> this is a little bit about uh, my clinic, we have um, now five surgeons. We have a couple of internists. We have uh, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, nutritionist, support group leader, psychologist. It's a big team. And the thing that helps lead the team is obviously having support from the hospital, which is always kind of a challenge. But um, here we've been able to get surgery to help support some of our um, uh, medical weight loss programs as well. I think you guys are familiar about, you know, why obesity is increasing, but I just wanted to highlight one last point, which is that bullet point at the bottom that most of the obese kids grow up to be obese adults. Biggest risk factor is going to be obese parents. So one thing that I always emphasize is treating the entire family. It's much like treating an asthmatic child. Um, if you send home that child to someone who's uh, parents who smoke, you haven't accomplished a lot. I put up this one slide just to emphasize one thing about what causes obesity, and that's really, don't forget about sleep. Uh, we believe in four pillars of weight loss, and that is diet, exercise, sleep, and stress management. Uh, you often have to convince people to come back to see you, so I try to give them different uh, components of those pillars. So if you think about it, it's four pillars. You come up with six different options for those pillars. You, a lot of factorials you can build into that, so different reasons for people to come in. I still use, you know, our BMI as, as our um, entry point. I think it's a good screen. We talk a lot about other anthropometric uh, evaluations, waist circumference that we collect. We can collect neck circumference as well. But you can see here that it's not always correct. There's our former governor in California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, a few years ago, Mr. Universe. Uh, but here he is a few years later. You can see that even Mr. Universe can, can gain weight over time. I um, want to show you, uh, obviously, something that was very important to us in, in time around uh, <clears throat> having the AMA declare obesity a disease. And I think it has full import in how we treat it. Because if it's a disease like any other, it has stages. And so there's different strategies you want for someone who is a stage 1 obese patient versus one who's a stage 4 obese patient. We have found that those patients who have a BMI greater than 50, to take a phrase from oncology, it's disseminated obesity. I remember the first uh, couple of cases I had, people at BMI 60s, 70s, were able to do the case technically very well, very happy about it afterwards. Uh, and then we follow up these patients. I've been doing now bariatric surgery for about 18 years. And you follow up some of these BMI 60, 70 patients, they still are pretty big, you know, five years later. So I think we've got to have a different paradigm. It needs to be beyond heroic surgery. We need to downstage these patients, as I'll show you in just a little bit. I think we all know the impact that obesity has on all the different um, areas of our body, you know, from literally from head to toe. You heard Dr. Ligabel mentioned um, the impact of cancer has. And I really want to compliment her on her leadership in, in bringing this to everyone's attention. Um, she was a key leader in getting ASCO to uh, have this uh, summit around providing um, collaborative care towards the patient with cancer. And so I, I recommend you read the, um, the article. It's a great blueprint. And again, I really appreciate her leadership on this issue. I did want to bring up one other disease, and that's the disease of complications. Uh, we perform actually more surgeries now in the United States than kids are being born. <clears throat> and a lot of those cases can have potential for complications. It's roughly about 10%. 
and about half of those are preventable. I'm giving you one example here, and that's around orthopedics. With the orthopedic cases, if you're particularly hip and knee replacement, you can see there that if you're obese, you've got a greater risk uh, for having uh, both infections, but also that the joint won't last. Those joints are made out of titanium. They're supposed to last for 30 years. But if you're obese, they're only going to last for 10, which raises your risk of revisions, harder cases to do. So one thing uh, that's changed for us in our practice is we get more referrals from orthopedics. And part of it has to do with bundle payment. Uh, with bundle payment, they get one price complication or not. So they are now incentivized to avoid complications. So I tell you, one place to, to partner with is with um, the um, uh, orthopedic surgeons. And not all of those uh, patients are going to be great surgical candidates, by the way. Uh, they tend to be older patients um, because they sometimes require NSAIDs. It's not always compatible with, say, a gastric bypass. So lots and lots of opportunity for medical weight loss for some of these um, uh, patients. You can see there the uh, mortality rates and the connection. I always like to point out, when do you see that inflection point? It's a BMI of 30. That's really the point where we need to start to intervene. It's yellow light, you know, from 25 to 30, but it's definitely a red light once you get to be my of 30. Uh, I know we've all seen these slides, and I just want to emphasize a couple of points as I go through them. One is that this is from the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey. So it's conducted by the CDC, but I don't know if you know this, it's a phone survey. So if somebody calls me up and asks me my height and weight, I'm probably going to gain a couple of inches in height, lose a few pounds. So this is likely an underestimate. And that was actually proven by, of all people, Mike Huckabee in Arkansas when he was uh, governor. He instituted a BMI report card. If you know Mike Huckabee, he's a Fox um, contributor, and he lost a lot of weight, so he became kind of an evangelist for weight loss. Uh, so he did this BMI report card where they went home with their grades, but they also got their BMI checked at the school. Uh, needless to say, it met with a lot of resistance in Arkansas, and the project was abandoned. A lot of the parents did not enjoy that. Uh, but what it did find was that the, this was an underestimate when they were done in, in person at, at the schools. You can see here that it's increased substantially over time. Uh, I think, it, you know, this is now 17 years old, but you can see the Mississippi at that point had greater than 25% of its inhabitants as being obese. I'm originally from Alabama, and our motto was, thank God for Mississippi, because <laughs> otherwise... <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be last in everything good and first in everything bad. But uh, we had one year to crow. You can see that Alabama joined it and so on. I think it's pretty interesting to see here that we're left with one lonely blue state. That's Colorado. I don't know if it's going to hold out, but you can see there that it didn't. Um, what was it about Colorado? You can mention the healthy lifestyle and things like that. But I think altitude actually plays a little bit of a role as well. I think you've seen that in some studies. But one other point to, to show you here is that if we put everybody in the United States who qualified for weight loss surgery, we'd have a whole new state, and it's a state of obesity. It's about 18 million people. So it's a lot of folks out there, and I'll, I'll share with you where we are with our numbers in bariatric surgery. Safe to say we're at less than 1% of treating patients, hence the need for more treatment modalities. Keep in mind, this is not just an over, the problem in the United States, it's a worldwide problem. I actually um, was here on the East Coast a couple of days ago giving grand rounds at Walter Reed. Um, and I pointed out that, you know, this is uh, not only a public health issue, but it's actually a national security issue. You know, there's that report from uh, at retired admirals and generals, too fat to fight. Uh, we should avoid the word fat, by the way, but that's what they labeled it. Um, and it said that 40% of recruits aren't able to complete basic training. Uh, the other thing that comes up is that some of our um, traditional uh, rivals, like, for example, China, uh, now has 10% of its population as diabetic. You know, in a nation of a billion people, it's 100 million. It's a huge drag on the economy. So I make the point to many payers that, you know, this is a way for us to be more productive and perhaps have some sort of advantage strategically down the road. I like to put up this one slide to show uh, that this was predicted about 10 years ago by a sociologist at University of Chicago that our life expectancy was going to go down. And it actually did, and it's no longer a fluke. It's gone down now uh, two years in a row. And the last time that that happened was in the 1950s where there was a flu epidemic. 
So I think some of the things that we've been predicting are coming to hold, uh, and that is where we're, we're seeing uh, chronic diseases like obesity start to have impact on our life expectancy. We're all kind of raised on that premise that the next generation is going to be better than the last, but it looks like from a health standpoint, that may not necessarily be the case. I'm often asked to, you know, um, uh, if you will, provide evidence, you know, why we need to do something for obesity. Well, if you don't care about a patient and all you care about is your pocketbook, uh, you can see that we spend a lot of money on it. It's about $300 billion a year. People ask, what about bariatric surgery? You know, it's covered uh, pretty routinely now, thankfully. Um, very few plans exclude it now. And one of the reasons that they include it is because there's good return on investment. And it occurs as early as a couple of years after surgery. Um, and I'll show you some more of that data. Here's a, uh, just a depiction of how much uh, Obamacare cost. It was roughly $200 billion. So one point we make to policymakers is that if we had kept our obesity rates at, you know, 1990 levels, we'd have more than enough money to cover uh, people for, for universal coverage. This is a study that we uh, did with the Truven database, which is an all-payer database um, across the United States. And we did match patients on the basis of their uh, weight and their comorbidities. The green line you can see here is bariatric surgery. You could see it did decline. You can see it's in contradistinction to the other uh, cohorts where it continued to rise. So something else that can occur over time. And maybe the way we bend the cost curve in healthcare is by addressing obesity. I'll point out one final cost, and I think you guys are all aware of this, is the cost that it takes on patients. These are a couple of shows, Mike and Molly and the original Roseanne, uh, and almost all the jokes are around people's weight, but it certainly has impact, impact when it comes to their ability to get jobs, uh, promotions, and things like that. Uh, you can see there that Roseanne had um, gastric bypass surgery. That does not account for her Twitter behavior, by the way. Um, John Goodman, you can see there, also had something done. He won't admit it, which is always troubling to me. We have so many patients who have benefited from, from weight loss in general, but simply don't want to come out and talk about it. They want to have that pride that they did it themselves. But I think the one thing we're all realizing is they can't do it all themselves and they need people like us, healthcare professionals, to help them. And we really need to develop uh, a sense of more advocacy from those patients so we can get better coverage. And I know everybody here is dealing with coverage for medications. And I think uh, we're at the point where we were in bariatric surgery about 15 years ago. So getting committed patients makes a big difference. I'll show you one other uh, toll, if you will, from carrying weight, and that's around uh, obesity disparities. We hear a lot of talk about gender and ethnic disparities of care, but there are, in my opinion, obesity disparities in care. Regardless of, uh, of the type of preventative procedure, whether it be breasts, uh, whether it be mammograms or pap smears, if your BMI goes up, there's a dose-dependent effect that your ability to get those preventative services go down. So in addition to Dr. Ligabel's um, uh, contributions of obesity towards uh, cancer, this is another one, you know, where they aren't getting preventative care. The other thing I'll add is that when it comes to dealing with uh, treatment for the obese cancer patient, um, about 40% don't often get the right kind of chemotherapy. And I do quality, and all of our surgical oncologists uh, will complain when they have to operate on a larger patient. So for, there's a lot of reasons why those outcomes aren't as great. You can see here there's a lot of interventions out there. I'll focus on the interplay it has with us in bariatric surgery. And one is obviously around medications. And this has been new. This has only really happened in the last couple of years. We're starting to use these medications preoperatively, again, taking a page from cancer. It's almost like adjuvant chemotherapy. Much like you'd shrink a tumor before you operate, maybe we can shrink some of these patients before we operate and have better long-term outcomes. I'll show you that some of the um, weight loss outcomes long-term have a great degree of variability. And if we're able to get some of the weight down prior to surgery, it can make a big difference. The other, um, we just finished a trial with one of these medications. We're presenting at Obesity Week in National in a couple of weeks, and it did have a pretty big impact. I want to mention one other new modality that we use in, in combination with surgery, and that is the balloon. And it's an endoscopic procedure, and we're able to place this balloon um, all through the mouth without any um, incisions. And you can see here that it's uh, meant to be temporary and not to compete with surgery. It's really meant for early stage um, 
B, uh, early stage obesity. So really about uh, patients who have BMIs 30 to 40. Um, here's one of them. You can see that it's a large balloon. It's two of them. It's about a liter. It's not currently covered by insurance. Uh, so these are still cash procedures. But for stage one obese or stage two obese patients, this can have a good uh, opportunity for weight loss. It's roughly about a 20 kilo weight loss. Um, and what happens when you remove the balloon? Well, most of them keep their weight off, but one thing that we've started doing with our balloon patients is starting medication for them. And the idea is that it's got maintenance therapy on board. And here you can see some of the weight loss results. Um, it's actually the uh, real world weight loss results are probably a little bit better than the FDA trial. And I think that's partly because they're paying for it as opposed to being part of a trial. Here's one of uh, my patients. Um, she was able to actually lose a little bit more weight than average, and um, you can see um, her there. Now, with diets, I think you guys are pretty familiar with this. This is an old trial from Marsha Stefanik showing about three kilo weight loss with a pretty large degree of intervention. I think you're all aware of the attrition rate. This is from um, Weight Watchers. This is probably January 1, I guess, uh, right? New Year's resolutions, and here we are at Thanksgiving a year later. And it does not matter which diet. Uh, one of my very good friends at Stanford is Christopher Gardner, who did the big NIH study about which diet matters. His, um, his grand um, summation was the diet that you can stick to is the one that works best. So that's why the cayenne, um, pepper, lemon, maple syrup diet probably is not good long term. Uh, you have to find the diet that works best for patients. And that's where I'll show you where surgery does make a big difference. I found this fascinating. There are actually fewer people dieting now than there were in the 1990s, even though we have more and more obesity. And I think it's just a reflection of how confused patients are about what they need to do. Uh, this, this article was terrific. It was by a um, New York Times uh, writer, and she pointed out how difficult it is to lose weight on your own. And we're not talking about, um, you know, patients with modest BMIs. We're talking about people with BMIs over 30, 35, where they find it pretty difficult to lose weight on their own. And I, I think a big reason for it is we understand the disease a lot better. Here you can see this pretty well depicted. This is Kevin Hall's Biggest Loser study. And you can see here that I think this puts to rest the idea of motivation as being the sole reason why people lose weight. Uh, if you've ever seen the show, uh, there's a lot of humiliation that goes on in the show. People are required to weigh in. They're yelled at. you got to be pretty motivated to do that, that show. So you can see people came in. Everybody here gained uh, weight when they stopped the show. There was one exception uh, where that patient lost weight, and that patient ended up having bariatric surgery. Uh, just to point that out. One other thing is, why is it? What happens with dieting? And I think you're well aware of some of the biological adaptation, but it never hurts to see it. The black dots are after you diet, the white dots are before you diet, and the peaks correspond to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Body is not stupid. It will do everything in its power to try to regain that weight. So it pumps up the volume. It makes it even harder to lose weight when you're dieting for that reason. GLP-1, as you hear from later, also has the same sort of role. Now, this is what happens with um, uh, gastric bypass. Ghrelin is way down here. It's almost near non-detectable. It's not a permanent effect, by the way. It's only for about the first six months. So that does give us an opportunity to get the right habits in place around portion control, about sleep and exercise. But it's a hunger holiday for about six months, and that's the time where they're not... Uh, you know, compelled to eat, to have that head hunger and things like that. So it's an opportunity for us to intervene. One quick mention about where we are with surgery. We are not the only answer. We need to have more people on board. But for a long time, we were kind of some of the, the first responders to it. And it was very similar to what occurred in cancer and TB, where there weren't other options. But like I said, we now have a brand new world where we have I think it's five FDA-approved um, drugs, five FDA-approved devices. And as I'll show you, surgery has never been more safe or effective. Who qualifies for weight loss surgery? It's BMI over 40 or BMI over 35 with comorbidities. Uh, we've tried to push the needle on this with insurers about using it for BMI 30 to 35 just for diabetics. Some limited success in Cleveland and Hawaii. I don't think they have anything else in common, uh, Cleveland and Hawaii, but they are two areas that were able to get coverage. There are really two surgeries now. 
It's uh, the sleeve gastrectomy and the gastric bypass. And I'll share with you kind of how they work. The sleeve is, as you can see here, uh, what we do is we take the stomach, uh, it's roughly about the size of a football, and make it into a long skinny tube. We do remove that portion of the stomach. This portion of the stomach is called the fundus. Its role, is one, its, its sole role is for expansion. And it used to render an evolutionary advantage. When we weren't sure when our next meal was coming from and we killed that deer or whatever it might have been, we needed to gorge ourselves because we weren't sure when the next meal was coming. We no longer have that problem. Uh, so getting rid of the fundus gets rid of the capacity to uh, be able to eat more. The other way it works is, and ghrelin is made here, by the way. This is where there's high levels of ghrelin production. But the other way it works is that if you get food from here into the distal intestine quickly, you get an uptake in GLP-1. And that's really kind of how bariatric surgery works. If you get food from the stomach to the distal gut quickly, big changes for GLP-1. So vitamin deficiency are actually relatively rare with a sleeve, uh, and it can be converted to gastric bypass if patients don't gain weight. Uh, if patients gain weight. The one thing I will say, it's one big Achilles heel though, is risk of reflux. When you make that new tube, it is a high pressure zone. You no longer have that capacitance of the fundus. And so we screen everybody ahead of time. We do an endoscopy to make sure they don't have reflux. People who have the biggest risk of having reflux after the sleeve are the ones who have it before. So we check. The weight loss is about 60% of excess weight loss. Um, which is a bit less than the gastric bypass. Um, here is the gastric bypass, and it's a, a very unique operation. Um, you can see here what we do is we create a brand new little stomach. It's roughly about the size of my thumb. That pouch is extremely small, and we physically divide it from the big stomach, divide the intestine in half, bring one loop up to the little to the pouch, and that way people are able to lose weight. There's a, several effects that are going on here. People have tried to deconstruct the gastric bypass because it's such an effective operation. If we can figure out how it works, then we can have other applications for it. One is you don't get that production of ghrelin because it's excluded. You actually have to have, have food contact with the stomach to produce ghrelin. The other thing that happens, again, is that very profound um, GLP-1 uptake when you get food to go distally. And then, um, for the interest of time, I can't show you some data about the microbiome. I heard a question about it, but we did a study with um, comparing the sleeve, the bypass, and medical weight loss. Only the bypass had substantial changes in the microbiome, which accounts for why you see some of this early resolution or remission of diabetes that occurs quite early. And the end defector is really the bile acids. The bacteria change that change the bile acids. The bile acids turn on a receptor called TRX5 that upregulates GLP-1. So we're starting to figure it out a little bit better. Almost all these procedures are now done uh, laparoscopically, about 95%. So quick return to work, uh, less issues with wound infections. Uh, the length of stay for these procedures are generally one to two days. Now, the bypass has terrific weight loss, but it does have more issues when it comes to vitamin deficiencies, uh, particularly ones listed there, B12, iron, folate, and calcium. Um, what we do is we check patients uh, both preoperatively and postoperatively. One interesting thing is that 40% of our patients prior to surgery had a micronutrient deficiency. So they had a calorically rich diet, but a nutritionally depleted diet. Uh, and we do check at three months, six months, and a year. Still the most common is iron deficiency that can occur, particularly in women who are childbearing age. Um, if you do uh, do iron supplementation, uh, please don't use ferrous sulfate. You use uh, ferrous gluconate or fumarate uh, because you need some of the acid for absorption. So that's another tip. If people aren't getting enough iron, add some vitamin C to it. And if you still have someone who's recalcitrant to iron supplementation orally, you can always do infusions. One other tip, please check for copper and zinc deficiencies too, because sometimes that can be an occult um, area. 
B12 is, if, if people are taking their vitamins, if they're doing their B12, they generally aren't going to have that issue. And again, these are relatively rare, particularly if you insist on patients taking it. I tell them it's just like transplant surgery. You're supposed to take those medicines for your whole life. You're supposed to take these vitamins your whole life. People often ask what happens to the old stomach. We don't remove it in a gastric bypass. There's a lot more harm in removing it. It just kind of hangs out and is quiescent, hibernates. This is a little summary about um, things that we look for preoperatively. We want to make sure patients are ready. We oftentimes sometimes get patients referred by like their mom or by their brother or somebody. And it's like patient comes in and his arms are folded. I'm not, I don't want to be here, that type of thing. So you got to make sure that they're ready for change. Uh, many of the insurers now require documentation of weight loss up to six months. There's one very punitive insurer, uh, Cigna, that requires it for a year. So if you are going to refer someone for bariatric surgery, the more you're able to document this it is very appreciated by patients <coughs> and by the surgeon. We do check their neck circumference and waist circumference. I, I do body composition um, with the body pod where you're able to get their fat composition and muscle mass. Patients like that, and they come in each time, and they want to see their number. Am I doing better? So it's another way of getting them back in. These are the labs that we check preoperatively as well at, as well at um, three months, six months, and annually. There's a CBC, a Chem 20, a TSH, cardiac risk factors, and the vitamins that you see listed there. I personally perform endoscopy on all our patients before we operate on them. I want to make sure there's no surprises, no cancers, no masses, and especially no reflux. We still do chest x-ray and EKGs in these patients. I do think the EKG is important. Many of these patients are on antidepressants, and um, you can have a prolonged um, QT interval in some of these patients that can have import when you bring them to the operating room. Some special uh, considerations, history of heart disease or sleep apnea, and, and certainly if they have prior history of VT, those are things we'll want to know. We try to do a little inventory of our patients beforehand if they come in <coughs> taking weight-promoting medications, i.e. some of the antidepressants, if we're able to convert them to Welbutrin, are we able to maximize metformin and GLP-1 agonist uh, instead of insulin, and making sure they don't use have anything else at home that can promote weight gain. BPA, for example, we did a study just recently came out where patients, we measured BPA. The people that had higher BPA did not lose as much weight. So another uh, obesogen that's out there. Post-operative follow-up, we see them at two weeks, three months, six months, and a year and annually. I partner with a lot of our primary care <coughs> providers to to help with their follow-up, and they're able to communicate directly with us. We look at their weight, their comorbidity, remission, if they've had any adverse events, the same labs, and we continue to measure them. Now, these are some of the <coughs> potential post-op complications. I like to say that um, even though we do this through little incisions, it's still a big operation, and things can occur. But as I'll show, we have a pretty good safety record. <coughs> You can see uh, when we try to decide between which procedure, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if patients have bad acid reflux or if they have diabetes longer than five years or insulin uh, use, we generally recommend the um, bypass. The BMI over 50, we do recommend the bypass because um, with a sleeve, uh, doing it in a patient with a BMI over 50, simply not strong enough medicine. And so patients end up sometimes regaining weight in fact, this is a study that we have, it's coming out in a, a couple of months, and it looks at the heterogeneity of weight loss. Not everybody loses weight the same way uh, when it comes to these different procedures. Uh, we included the band because we went back historically. We've done about 3,500 cases, and we want to include the, the band patients. Um, bands now, though, are pretty uncommon. Uh, we take out more bands than we place. So it's really not a procedure we do anymore. Uh, we never were able to figure out what worked and didn't work in a band. There are some patients that actually did pretty well with a band. It was about 50%, but we never were able to predict. Uh, and it's almost like a glass half full, half empty. depends on your perspective. But here you can see some of the heterogeneity of the weight loss. The bypass, this is all the way out to three years. 
Um, it looks like a bell curve, pretty normal distribution, but look at the sleeve. You can see here as time progresses, patients have less uh, weight loss and the, and the band is even more dispersed. So clearly we have to figure out a better way of figuring out which patients should have which kind of surgery. Uh, part of it now is just based on surgical judgment which is frankly intuition. Uh, we can look at some of the data that we have out there, but it's not all that um, um, illuminating. But we're hoping to figure out other ways. And what we're partnering with um, certain genetic companies to see if some of those can predict. Uh, and we can have better precision medicine about who's gonna have the most weight loss. The other thing that we're doing is we're, we're starting a trial with placing patients on metformin after weight loss surgery, again, taking a page from oncology. Just as you do remove a breast cancer, some of those patients may stay on tamoxifen. So what's wrong with keeping someone on a, on a weight loss medication so we can preserve some of the, uh, the weight loss after surgery? Now, these are some of the preventable complications, ulcers, gallstones. We give patients um, a PPI for six months. We keep them on Actigol for six months. Maybe there's a little slight data about bile acids helping for weight loss as well. And obviously the vitamin deficiencies. I've already mentioned iron and B12, but let me mention thiamine. If you have a patient who comes in who's throwing up a lot, please remember that that could be a precursor to thiamine deficiency, uh, Wernicke-Korsakoff and things like that. So it presents with nystagmus or lower extremity weakness. Please be aware of it because it's very preventable. If it's not treated, though, you can have permanent uh, memory loss. It's a very rare outcome, but it's one that I always warn people about. And in our institution, we have a protocol. Any bariatric patient that comes in, even if it's for a hangnail, gets a banana bag. So we automatically treat them right away. A couple of things here about, you know, uh, inadequate weight loss, which is relatively rare. Uh, with a bypass, about 2% of patients don't have adequate weight loss. With the sleeve, it's about 20. And with the band, it's about 50. So, but fear are some of the reasons. One is grazing, and that's uh, exactly how it sounds. They can't eat a whole lot all at once because their stomach is small. But uh, if you're able to keep them from... Um, from grazing, you'll decrease your risk of gaining weight. And the idea is they stick to set meal times. I tell them it's simple as four by four, four small meals, four hours apart. Uh, liquids can be a killer as well. Uh, nothing we do at the time of surgery will prevent liquids from going down. Always caution patients around uh, the coffee drinks, the mochaccino lattes with the whipped cream and unicorn dust and everything else that Starbucks puts on them nowadays. So be careful with it. And uh, alcohol, alcohol is a big one. Uh, single glass of red wine, 120 calories, liquids meant for hydration. The last one is making sure that they do eat a uh, good breakfast um, and making sure that they avoid that big meal at the end of the day, you know, where they deserve a break that day and they have a big meal, their metabolism slows down. It's a terrific way of gaining weight. So still about 82% of our patients are female, and I always remind them you should eat like a queen for breakfast, a princess for lunch, and a pauper for dinner. So if you look at some of the risk factors that we have in surgery, take a look at these here in weight gain right before we operate on them can lead to more complications. It actually swells the liver, so it's something that uh, we definitely want to avoid. Their uh, sugar is not in good control. That leads to more wound infection. So uh, we are uh, pretty adamant about not having weight gain, period. And then with the higher BMIs, we really strive to get at least a 5% weight loss. Uh, we did this randomized study uh, almost 10 years ago now, and we found that they have less complications, more weight loss. We have now done a randomized trial with a, a medication that we're presenting in a couple of weeks. Um, the other thing that obviously matters is um, exercise and, you know, you can have different activity <clears throat> prompts. And this was uh, just a, a study where we gave people a pedometer to get to 10,000 steps. And it did have a significant difference for those patients who were using the pedometer. Here's one of our patients um, here for her, for her uh, exercise of choice was roller derby. Not something we usually recommend. Uh, you can see there, but it's, it got her to sweating. Anytime we talk about any sort of surgery, we have to talk about safety. I think that's the first thing. And about, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the mortality rates with bariatric surgery were about one or two out of 100. Uh, so they were higher. 
and the insurers were frankly worried about it. And so a partner and I wrote an editorial when some of these data were presented, and we said that we need to do these in specialized centers, they have the right resources, the right kind of volume. And so what's happened since is we've had an accreditation model, and here's the, the two um, programs that now have merged into one, and here's some of the results. We can see that we started out with that one to two percent uh, per hundred, and now we're about one out of a thousand. So our mortality rates now are equivalent to hip or knee replacement or removal of a gallbladder. So it's been a tremendous change in about 10 years, and it was really uh, prompted by the accreditation programs. This is a study that I did a few years ago where we looked at the results of people having surgery at accredited programs versus non-accredited. And you can see there that um, there's less cost, there's less complication, less mortality at accredited centers. The last one is something called failure to rescue. That's a health services research term that means if you have a complication and then go on to die, that's failure to rescue. And it is much lower at these institutions that are accredited because they have protocols in place, they have resources, and they have experience. Um, so uh, we have over 800 hospitals now that are accredited, so there should not be an access issue for anybody to, to get to these centers. Now, does uh, bariatric surgery work when it comes to weight loss and comorbidity uh, remission? I'll share with you the uh, or probably our most famous trial, which is the <coughs> SOS trial, the Swedish Obese Subjects Trial. And you can see here that this patients that didn't have surgery stayed pretty level. This is the band. This is an old procedure called the vertical banded gastroplasty. And here is the bypass. You can see that everybody regained a little bit of weight. But at the end of 10 years, they still kept most of their weight off. So it does show that people are able to have good long-term results. Here's uh, the results at our own institution in one year. Our BMI is actually a little bit higher. Uh, our BMI now is about close to 50. And so we do get most of those patients close to a BMI of 30. Uh, diabetes uh, remission at one year is about 82%. That does degrade over time to about 60% at five years. And again, I think what we need to do is safeguard those early results by introducing other modalities to preserve them. These are again are some of the outcomes uh, that are current. You can see there that the mortality rates are about 0.1%. This is a good study. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Ligabel mentioned this earlier. It's a Ted Adams study. It was done out of Utah. It compared people that had surgery versus those who didn't on the basis of age, weight, and comorbidity. Um, pretty big population-based study, and what they found was uh, overall at five years a reduction of 40% in mortality overall. And you can see there that uh, the cancer reduction was also pretty substantial. Uh, those are pretty impressive numbers, and the one thing that came up was, you know, is this something that's sustainable? You got it at five years, but what happens beyond that? So here's 12-year data that Dr. Adams followed up, and it did demonstrate the same results. I do want to say that there were one couple of areas here that indicated something that we need to be aware of. Uh, there was one area where there was increase in mortality after surgery, and that was around accidents and suicides. I personally think what binds those together is alcohol abuse. Um, and you've heard a lot about that uh, in relationship to bariatric surgery. Um, I think uh, about 50% of patients who come through the ED for trauma have alcohol on board. Uh, easier to, to have suicide ideation and completion if you're uh, drinking. So we've also heard anecdotally from patients that they have changes in how they feel after drinking. So we ended up doing uh, the first study. I actually was prompted to do this by a patient who came in who saw a show on, uh, in, on Oprah about addiction transfer. So that's where we get all of our information now about healthcare, uh, Oprah. Uh, but anyway, I looked it up. And there, wasn't a, there weren't any data around it. And so we did a very simple study. Uh, we uh, checked people's breath alcohol level before and after weight loss surgery. Uh, and we gave them wine there, and we had no trouble recruiting for this study. We had a lot of people <laughs> sign up for it. Uh, but here are the results, and what we found was that preoperatively, you can see here, single glass of red wine, 0.02, but here it is post-op, and you can see here that that is legally intoxicated in California. What we found was this was unique to the gastric bypass. 
not with a band and not with the sleeve. It actually had zero to do with addiction transfer. It had everything to do with physiology. The receptors in our body that process alcohol or alcohol dehydrogenase receptors are in two places. They're in the stomach and they are in the liver. So if you bypass the stomach, then you're going to not have that first pass metabolism. So it really was an issue for our bypass patients only, and that's been proven out. Uh, I've continued to do this kind of work um, actually with cancer patients that had their stomach removed. They had the exact same effect. So again, you know, it shows like a lot of this is not psychology. A lot of it can be physiology. I've already demonstrated. Uh, so what we do now is we warn patients. We tell them, you know, uh, it's easier to get uh, tipsy afterwards with this. Please don't drink and drive. Don't forget about the caloric content of your, uh, of your alcohol. We have long-term results. You know, I showed you 10-year data, 14-year data, 7-year data here. I have now, we're getting our 15-year data together to present. So we have some durability results, and I think we can do a better job when it comes to long-term follow-up. Uh, the issue that comes up for us is change in insurance occurs about for 30% of patients within three years. That's the churn rate. And then about 17% of patients move to another state. So follow-up has become harder. We're working to get better means of follow-up, including patient-reported outcomes that are validated. So we'll be able to get a truer sense. Now, I wouldn't be a weight loss surgeon if I didn't have some show-and-tell pictures. So I'll demonstrate some of those for you here. This is one of our patients that was able to lose weight, get rid of her comorbidities. But frankly, the biggest thing she was um, happy about was being able to get on a plane and not worry about getting a belt extender. And that was kind of the first thing that she did. So not only hopefully we're improving quantity of life, but hopefully quality of life as well. Uh, I do a handful of adolescent weight loss surgeries a year. I do maybe a dozen. Uh, I think it should be safe and rare. I think it's a rare individual uh, adolescent that is prepared to do weight loss surgery. And at Lucille Packard, our children's hospital, we have a whole team that works with our patients and is able to navigate that difficult time for the adolescent. But for some patients, it really can make a pretty big difference, but you have to have significant follow-up care for them. Here is uh, one of our other of our patients. Her um, grandmother passed away from complications of both diabetes and Alzheimer's. She was worried the same thing was going to happen to her. You can see that she lost a lot of weight, but she was off 80 units of insulin postoperatively. But she got us to thinking about what happens as we get older and we carry weight. The unfortunate reward may be dementia. Uh, so we do know that cognition, our ability to think and remember and process, can be improved with diet. It can also be improved with control of blood sugar. So we did a few studies looking at the effect of uh, bariatric surgery on cognition. This is just one of those studies. It's the uh, trail making test. You uh, connect the numbers one through 25 without lifting your pencil from the paper. You're graded on speed and accuracy. But the end result was this, regardless of the type of cognitive test, we did see improvement. Uh, we've since followed this up as to figuring out why did we see improvement in cognition. Uh, and it could be related to better glycemic control. It could be related to less inflammation that's implicated with Alzheimer's. It could also be an improvement in mood. Depression could change. And uh, finally, um, changes in sleep. Certainly, if you're sleep deprived, you're not going to be uh, on top of your cognition. The, what we ended up finding was the glycemic control is what mattered the most. It was the, the biggest determinant. I'll share with you one other um, study we did just recently that got published, and that was looking at the effect of weight loss on the aging process. Um, doing aging studies is difficult. You have to wait 80 years, so people look for surrogate markers, and this is one of them, and that is the telomeres, and they're the ends of the chromosomes that get constantly um, divided. And so what you want to have is a nice long telomere uh, to prevent degrading of the chromosome. It reminds me of these little things at the end of the shoelaces so they don't unravel. Uh, what we ended up finding was that we did not see uniform improvement across the board for patients after surgery, but we did see improvement with people that had high inflammation. So there were certain people that had um, actual uh, lengthening of the telomere after surgery, but it was only in the ones who had that high CRP beforehand. Another one of our patients, he's a physician. Uh, he's actually an endocrinologist. He was worried about the fact that he was on his way to starting insulin. 
Um, he had been on metformin for years, and he was also worried that he had a, a low testosterone, which is an independent cardiac risk factor for men. Um, he was able to get his weight down, and we also did another study looking at the impact that weight loss had on testosterone. You see all the late night ads about um, low T and things like that. Well, the answer here is frankly um, weight loss. As the weight went down, testosterone doubled, and it has to do with the fact that fat gets aromatized to estrogen, uh, which is what competes with testosterone in men and can decrease it. But a way of boosting testosterone is through weight loss. It has impact for patients who are sarcopenic, obviously. So if you're able to get that weight down, you can build up some muscle at the same time. Another uh, patient here, she tried for many years to get pregnant, wasn't able to get pregnant. Um, very expensive, you know, for the fertility medications. About a year after surgery, she was able to get pregnant. We don't recommend that patients get pregnant in the first year because they're losing weight too quickly, not safe for them or for their child. If you have a patient who's post-bariatric and is pregnant, please check labs every trimester. Please also give them super supplementation of folate. Instead of 0.4 milligrams, give them the full milligram. So just one thing to remember. I do want to point out that if you are able to, to lose weight after surgery, it does decrease your risk of adverse events during pregnancy, and you can see that in the study we did a few years ago. One of our, my last patients I'll show you here is a former high school wrestling coach. He now owns his own life insurance company, and you can see him there before surgery. He had had two open-heart surgeries, was on a bunch of different medications, and they sent him um, for us to, to see what we could do to help. We've done a, a great job when it comes to cardiac risk and decreasing smoking, but unfortunately we've replaced it with obesity. And if you look at the uh, obesity maps and the heart disease maps, they look virtually identical. So we've done a few studies looking at the impact of weight loss on heart disease, particularly cardiac risk factors. So at, uh, total cholesterol drops, LDL certainly drops. HDL, which is kind of hard to bring up, actually goes up after surgery, and it's about a 20% boost. Triglycerides, which track very closely with um, blood sugar, also decrease uh, substantially. Some of the newer ones, and you can argue you know, how predictive they are, like homocysteine and lipoprotein A, they also decline uh, substantially. But if you believe Paul Ritger uh, you know, from, from Boston, probably the single best predictor of future heart risk is, uh, is a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Anything above three is considered abnormal. Our patients started out at eight, and at the end of a year, they came down to about 1.4. So again, it underscores that obesity is truly an inflammatory disease, and we can make a big difference in that direction. There's our coach uh, from a few years ago, and here he is with his wife uh, a couple, and his son. I'll close with what I started with, which is I do believe obesity is a family disease, and we really should treat the entire family. I think that's something we can aspire to, intergenerational clinics. Um, and what we find is that people want to help each other. They help reinforce. Uh, so these are, um, this is a family, husband and wife, you can see there with their kids, uh, operated on them on the same day. And here you can see them about a year later. So I didn't operate on the kids, but certainly there was a halo effect for them as well, where they were able to lose weight too. So I'm going to just close there and just show you a uh, newest member of my family. He's one year old, so I'm going to head home and see him today. So thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. This has been a Dana Miller Video Network presentation.